So, uh, well, this is actually a, a, a field that has, I think, a lot of ethical implications, <laughs> which I am not going to, because I, <laughs> because I'm irresponsible. Um, the, okay, so, what, just uh, uh, talking about any, uh, predictable consequences, you know, to, in order to come at the consequences that you may, I may put you to sleep, I, I, I like to start with the conclusion so you can actually relax for the remaining part. <laughs> and so, um, the, 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 that's essentially, these are the, the, the things I'm going to talk about, the fact that the brain-machine interfaces have two sides. One is the side where uh, the code uh, movement intention uh, from brain signals and, uh, and controls an external device. The other side is that the interfaces, at least in their potential development, would also transmit sensations, so encode, uh, encode information from the external world and, 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 and translate it into stimuli. I'll discuss some of the difficulties, some of the, of the features there. Uh, the body-machine interface has the same acronym, BMI. Uh, it's less sexy immediately because the idea of brain-machine interface was, was, but I think it's maybe more uh, practically possible, and not based on the ability of the, of, the, of the body, of the motor system to reorganize itself or to, uh, to remap coordination. And there are studies that suggest that essentially what our brain does is capturing the geometry of uh, space and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and so remap it into different uh, uh, pattern of movement so that you can actually use parts of bodies that are not intended to do something, to do something they're not intended to do. Uh, the, uh, all this can be used and, and is being used and exploited for uh, creating families of non-invasive interfaces for people with paralysis and a number of things. So there are, there are these two approaches are coexisting and they are, uh, they don't only have the same acronym, but they have many of the same underlying problems and concepts. Uh, so that's basically what's going to be. So you can go. So now I'm probably not going to finish what I'm, what I'm planning to do, but it doesn't matter really. So the, let me start from the brain-machine interface and give a little bit of a of, uh, of, uh, of history. So the brain-machine interface is actually an idea that, well, was uh, kind of came up early on, like in the 60s, but was largely, largely ignored when it first came up. It, and it and has a resurgence at the, at, the, at the transition of the millennium somewhat uh, across the last part. And it's based on basically some, some kind of not very strong, not very formalized knowledge about what the brain is doing and what the what I say, M1 is the part of the motor of the cortex, of the cerebral cortex that uh, controls the, the output commands to uh, generate movement. So there are some sort of a, uh, sort of generally broad questions that neuroscientists, neurophysiologists have been asking about what is that is encoded by activities in the brain. And so uh, early on, uh, Ed Everts, in the 60s, uh, was uh, considering uh, a, a question that sounds relatively simple: is is the activity in the brain telling, for instance, the way a, a, a limb would move, or is the activity telling what forces the muscle must exert? So, in one way, you can see it as, as a, this activity representing something about the kinematics, the intended motion, and the other is just representing the the way the movement is created by, 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 by generating forces. And so he uh, made an experiment. So one thing that people think is, how, how do you dissociate forces from motion, right? That's a very simple thing. Can you actually dissociate those two? So what Everts came up is a, is, a, is a relatively simple idea. To dissociate forces from motion, what you have to do is to apply an external load. And so for instance, suppose that you look at this joint, which is the elbow, and can go uh, say in this direction, which is called flexion, or in this direction, which is called extension. So if I want to flex, typically I say, well, I activate the biceps, right? And, uh, and I relax the triceps, which is the opposite muscle. But now suppose that I, am, uh, I, am, I have applied a force that push me up, right, the arm. And so at this point, in order just to be at rest, I have to react to this force by, by counteracting with the, with the tricep muscles. And, and so at this point, if I want to move, uh, it, the move, moving the arm up would actually not correspond necessarily to activating the bicep muscle, but by changing the activity in the opposite muscle, because 
you're, you're resisting less the force that is applied itself. So by playing this kind of tricks, he was then looking how neurons, uh, nerve cells in the motor area would, uh, would respond in, in, in this type of task, the recording from, from um, cortex, the motor cortex of monkeys. And, and, uh, and he found that, that the answer seemed to suggest that, that really those activities are reflected the muscles and not the movement. Uh, the muscle forces, right? So they would uh, be co correlating with that. Now, about 20 years later, you have another study, Georgiopoulos, which looked at the same problem in slightly different ways in asking monkeys to make movement in, a, in, in two targets on a plane, right? And, and then he found that the neurons in the, in the, if you look at the activity of individual neurons, the activity of the individual neurons would have a peak for a particular direction. So it's like, it's like nerve cells in the brain have a preferred direction, and so they are coding for a direction of movement in space. So it came with an opposite view. So say, no, the movement of the motor neurons are code for preferred direction. Now, this is not settled, okay? Now there are views, there are people that suggest, well, it's half, as, half are going like this, half are going like that. It's, it's, a, it's a very diffi difficult question to, to answer, but through all this process, what some more engineer realized at some point is that uh, no matter what specifically is being encoded by uh, those neural activities, uh, it is possible to use neural activities to somewhat uh, predict the movement. It's, it's possible to, to read out activities in the brain to, uh, to control devices, right? So there are two families of uh, interfaces that came up uh, you know, on these ideas. One are the External interfaces based on EEG, where you record just with electrodes on the skull uh, electrical signals from the brain, and then you have people controlling with the EEG activity a cursor. These are signals that are not, you know, they're difficult they're to, to, to analyze, and so those are interfaces that are not extremely efficient. And then another approach was to actually have uh, electrode arrays implanted in, in the brain. So, uh, just to give you a, a, an idea of um, what uh, this is a, a clipboard. Do I have some? Do I have some here? Yes, probably. No, I don't have some. I can get you some. Okay. <coughs> or some, maybe I don't have it here. It's my fault. Oops, let me go back. Matthew Nagel was paralyzed from the neck down after being stabbed several years ago, but technology gave him hope. He was one of four testing BrainGate, a new technology where a chip is implanted in the brain that picks up electrical impulses. A computer then interprets those impulses as actions. The chip is implanted just beneath the patient's skull and is only a few millimeters square. Here's Matthew playing the computer game. He's not using a mouse or a joystick, rather he's thinking of where to move the paddle. All thoughts are electrical impulses, and after extensive research and testing, a computer has been trained to decode those impulses and create the corresponding actions. Okay, now, now I, is it? No. I want to stop it here, um, just because I thought that part of the class is, I would like to just get a little bit onto the ideas that are behind this decoding those signals. Um, one, one thing that you, that strikes me about those brain machine interfaces that uh, they are, on one hand, uh, advanced, but on the other hand, somewhat primitive, right? You think about this little array, which is going to pick up a, a teeny, n almost negligible proportion of n brain activities. Whenever you do, your whole brain is, is, is active, right? So you take on a little piece, and then looking at that, you are trying to somewhat pr produce artificial behaviors. So clearly, the, 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 the big thing here, the big challenge is to somewhat have the subjects learn to control that the few neurons that are near those, those uh, chips, those, those, those electrodes, to produce the, the intended movement. So the, in science, what happens often, and I thought what, what is fascinating here, is that you, know, you, you, you use science from one field to, to understand another one. So Maxwell used science from the electric 
electromagnetic phenomena to understand light. Uh, people use mechanics to understand electricity. So we do that all the time. So there's a little bit of that in this field too. And, uh, and uh, now, I'm, I, I try not to be too technical. How many of you are, I suppose many of you are, are engineers. Uh, how many of you know what the Kalman filter is? Okay. So I'm, I'm, going to, I'm not going to say what the Kalman filter is because it's, it's, a, it's a course, okay? But I'm going to try to make you, give you a little sense of it. But I want, most, most of all, I would like to give you the, the sense of, uh, of, of the, the idea, the general idea. So here is the concept of a Kalman filter. Uh, Kalman filter actually has to do with the theory of how we uh, estimate uh, what's called state estimation it is, is, a, is, a, is a theory of how we combine what we know about the process and what we measure to come out with a conclusion of what is the state of the process right? and, uh, and the problem the reason why that makes it problematic is that the knowledge is incomplete uh, and is noisy and also the observations are noisy so you're, you're, you, have, you have two sets of informations that are uh, that are not precise, and you want to find the best, the, or the, the most likely, uh, you know, outcome, the most likely state. So let me let me let me give you an example. That's very simple. Suppose that you drop, you, you observe a, a ball uh, falling, right? Uh, so the, this you know from physics that they fall with an uh, acceleration g, which is constant, and uh, you want to know where the ball is at a particular point of time. So you observe it, but you know the, your your vision is blurred. Right? And so you have noise attached to that. Not only that, so you have two things. You have the fact that the vision is blurred, and you have also the fact that the, that the knowledge of uh, the, the, the physics is, is limited because there may be some wind around. Right? So there are, there are two types of errors. So um, I, I have to try to do this because that's the only little math that I'm going to do here. Uh, you know the things that positions, velocity, acceleration, you can this kind of thing, right? So suppose that you call uh, h is the height of uh, the ball at a particular time. So I'd say that you have h of uh, h of uh, t is the height of a ball at, the, at an instant of time, right? And then you have uh, h uh, dot of t is the speed with which the ball is falling at instant of time, right? The velocity of falling. And then you have another thing which is called h double dot of t, which is the uh, acceleration with which this thing is falling, okay? So when you write the, uh, the, the model, you can, you can say that, uh, say the, the uh, h of t, say after a certain time delta, take all those things a certain time delta, right? H of t of delta is equal to the h of t plus the velocity of t multiplied by, by, uh, by that, which is the, the amount of time that passes. So this is the way you define a velocity. Then you say that uh, this h dot of t is equal to h dot of t plus delta h dot of t plus h double dot of t times delta. And then you have the last thing, they say h dot is double dot of t is equal simply of h double dot of t because it's equal g, it falls always with g. So if you, if you take these three things, you basically you can construct what is called a state vector, which is something which you call x, uh, x, x which is, is, a, is a combination of h, of h sorry, oops, I'll put it erase. Yeah. Combination of uh, mm -hmm. still have it? Yeah. Uh, h, h dot, h dot of that. Okay. Oops. And so uh, you have you construct basically you can rewrite this by saying that uh, x of t plus delta is equal a matrix which has the terms one delta zero zero one delta and zero zero one. Is, is it? I'm just rewriting those equation, which multiplies x of t, right? So here is 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 a is a is a is a very simple way to say what I know about the process. So 
you say, well, this is, uh, uh, you can rewrite it by saying that x of uh, t plus delta is equal to a certain matrix A, which multiplies x of t. Right? If you have, if you have a, a proper state. So if you know that, what the, the Kalman, uh equation says that basically you, you have two elements. One is called a process. X is what we, what we call the state. Used at k instead of t, but it's the same thing. So here is what we just wrote. We just have a term here, wk, which is noise. Okay, is the fact that you know you, you don't have precisely this term, but you have some noise added. And then there are some strong hypotheses that are made about that noise, like being normal and zero mean and so so on and so forth, which are limiting factor in many cases. And then you have an observation. The observation is, for instance, the position, you can throw away all the other velocity acceleration thing and just consider the positions. So you, have, you have a projection matrix, is a, is, a, is a matrix H, right? So Z is, is the observation, and Q is another term, which is the noise, the, the noise in my, my eye system. So basically, there are two types of noise. The one is the process noise, the, the fact that I know the process incompletely, and the other is the observation noise. Okay. So this is actually, all these theories actually at the uh, at a sort of a military origin, so you can shoot down airplanes or, or missiles by looking at them and, and then attracting them. And there's Norbert Wiener also had another type of approach to the same pro problem, and they developed in World War II. Or, so these are the, the, the origin of those of all those uh, nice sciences. It's actually, for the origin of computer science, is the same. So the same both. But the point is that. Uh, so the Kalman filter is essentially based on the idea that first you use the process model, okay, uh, ignoring the fact that there's a noise. You suppose you're in a certain state at time k minus 1, and you uh, derive, based only on what you know of the process, what is going to be the next state at time k. And then you, you observe, you know, your sensor are going to observe what is effectively the, the output of this, and, and compare it to the, 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 what you calculate. From, from the state, and so you create an error. So in other words, you have an error, uh, a, 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 an error of the of an observation error, and uh, and on so in one, on one hand you you decide that what is called the posterior estimate, that is your, your best estimate of what your what, where, what the state is, is what you have ignoring the noise plus the, the error multiplied by by a gain, which is called the Kalman gain. But essentially, what the Kalman gain does is simply modeling. Is, 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 a, is a term that creates a balance between the process uncertainty and, and, the, and, the, and the observation uncertainty. So in other words, it's like saying, if it's, it's actually something that has a lot of, uh, uh, lot of basis on, on perceptions. Like people can use that to understand how you compare vision and, and proprioceptive sense, right? So if you, have, if you have, or if you have a model, if you have a model that uh, tells you that the the thing is, is a certain position, and the model is a certain uncertainty. You want to weight the the, the uncertainty of the prediction inversely to its amount of. Uh, you want to weight the prediction inversely to the amount of uncertainty that it has. So this is the way you derive the common gain. So the more you are, you're, the more you are, uh, the least uncertainty you have of uh, of the model, the more importance you give to the model, which is your prior information. The more uncertain you are of the model, the more importance you give to your feedback, your sensory feedback, your sensation. So you have a trade-off, and Kalman, it's a, it's, a, it's a lot of algebra. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very tedious algebra also, but essentially that's what he accomplished, is to, is to, is to formalize this in, in very solid terms. Now, this is, as I say, is predicting how an airplane flies in order to shoot it down. Okay? So what does it do to brain-machine interface? Well, you can take the same viewpoint of the, of the falling ball, if I can go back to that picture. Now, suppose that what you observe here now is, a, is something that moves, okay? Maybe moved in gravity or in other ways, right? So there's a cursor that moves on the screen, right? But now suppose that you're asked to a person that has some electrodes in the brain to imagine that you're controlling that movement, right? So, you know, this thing is moving, but imagine that you are doing it, okay? It's a kind of a strange Zen exercise, right? 
And, and so, what effectively, when you look at the activity of the brain in that particular region, the activity of the brain is an estimate of where the, the, the person thinks this thing should move, right? And so then you can use the same machinery, basically, to, to the same mathematical machinery to use activity from the brain to create estimates of what is the intention, what is the intended movement. And this is done by somewhat a phase in which you expose the patient. This is for the patient, for instance, the paralyzed patient. They are typically sitting on a chair. They are looking at this cursor moving, and they are asked to think, you're, think that you're moving it. And as the person is thinking that they're moving, the brain becomes active. That particular piece of brain, minuscule piece of brain under the electron, becomes active in some ways. And, and you can look at this activity as an observation, as, a, as an observation of, 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 uh, of the, 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 the object that is falling. So you, you consider that as, a, as, a, as an observation term in the Kalman model to compare with the, with the statistics of the, of, the, of, the, of the ball that is moving. And then later on, you can use this to, uh, to the code, to the code activity. And this actually has become one of the current uh, most uh, you know, used approaches by the group of Donna, you and Tro. Uh, these are earlier studies where actually they had monkeys moving a manipulandum, and so they, they had this, this, uh, this uh, uh, the, the some of the cursor moving as a consequence of the motion of the arm. And, uh, and then they, they recorded the activity from the brain, and the activity from the brain learned to predict the motion of the cursor. So the red thing, the blue thing is actually in time, the, the actual movement, no, the other way around. I think that the red thing is the actual movement, and the blue thing is the, is, the, is, the, is the estimated movement from the brain activity. So once you have that, then you can, you know, once you, you have done this exercise, you can use the brain activity to control something. And of course, there is some extra thing to do, which has to do with, with learning, with motor learning. I think I'm running way behind that. that doesn't, um, okay. So this is the motor side, okay? We're talking about brain machine interface as, as a coding, decoding brain activities, right? To produce movement. Now, that's not all what we do, because you know, when, when you grasp an object like this, right? You, you feel the object, you feel how heavy it is, you, you feel the temperature of the object, you feel the shape. All of those things are communicated by by your, your, your sensor in the arm, they're communicated through the brain by uh, sensory patterns. And so an area uh, of neuroscience that is, that is developing is a little behind, th this is the area that's called the encoding, so where you encode information. This is running a little behind the decoding area. So people have been first you know, trying to decode activities to, to control device, but now they're thinking also of how can we transmit information by electrical stimuli to the brain? So this is an early experiment by the group of Ranulfo Romo. And uh, he was recording in an area, which is called the somatosensory area, where uh, there is information uh, about, uh, about, uh, about sensation of, of uh, tactile information about the skin. And, uh, and so what he was doing, this is a very simple case in which you, you, you stimulate the uh, the, say the left end of a monkey with the, with the, with something that vibrates with a frequency, and then uh, on the other side of the brain, you're you're produ producing a, an electrical you, att you attach an electrical stimulus. Not on the other side, on the same side that is the one that would, would actually perceive the the right uh, the right hand. And so what basically is asking to, to the monkey to do is to discriminate and say which one of those two stimuli is, is faster. And so it was showing that successfully, the, 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 through the stimulation, the monkey was able to, to somewhat compare the, the frequency of the electrical stimulus with the frequency of the mechanical stimulus. It's a very, very basic thing, but basically what, what came out is from the studies that this is possible to do, the, the temporal discrimination. Then another study, a little more recent, has not to do with time discrimination, but with spatial information, so there's the possibility to, uh, to, to produce the information about the location of an object. This is an experiment by uh, the group of uh, Jose Carmena at Berkeley, 
where uh, they had the experiment done on, on, on rats. And the rats typically would, would, uh, would use the vibrissa to uh, find the location of an object. So basically the rat was, was, uh, was, um, uh, was, uh, was rewarded for, for, for touching an object uh, with the vibrissa in a certain region of space. And then they were, were essentially, instead of having the object itself, they produce a, an electrical stimulus that was equivalent to the stimulus that were produced by the vibrissa and were very fine that the rat would actually go and stimulating in the same region, more or less. So, in other words, you can produce. Uh, it's difficult, though. The stimulation is a very difficult uh, thing to do uh, because there are several, several problems. But you can, you, the, the, the idea is that it is, at least in principle, possible to communicate spatial and, and temporal information with a, with a big caveat here, because this actually comes from earlier experiment in the, in the, actually in the 60s, they were published later by uh, Benjamin Libet. Uh, the timing in the brain is still not yet well understood. And these are experiments that uh, Lippert did with human subjects that were undergoing brain search. Okay, and so let me say the experiment is this: is you have on the on the right hemisphere, okay, you have sensitivity for areas of the skin on on the left hand. So if you stimulate somatosensory cortex in the right right somatosensory cortex in the in the representation of the hand, you will feel some touch. In, in the in the left hand, right, and so what uh, Libet was doing was doing applying stimulation of of of, uh, of uh, electrical training stimulation to the say the right cortex, and at the same time, uh, not at the same time, but it was also applying a, an, a, a, a a little electrical shock to the skin of the right hand, which would go to the other cortex. So if you think of it, if you are here already in the brain, all right, you should actually, you, you should actually be there already. If you, if, you, if you stimulate electrically the skin, uh, the information has to go through the nerves to the brain and then to be processed. So all the logic there would make you expect that if you stimulate electrically here and electrically in the brain, at the same time, you would actually have feel the stimulation in the brain, corresponding to the stimulation in the brain as happening before, because it's already there, right? It's not to go through the sensory flow. And in fact, what we found it was exactly the opposite. We actually found that when you stimulate the skin, you know, the subject was perceiving the skin stimulation as happening before the corresponding skin sensation coming from the electrical stimulus of the brain. And before by, by substantial amount of time, not by small amount of time. And so, so then that led to a whole set of very interesting but very complex issues about, about time and consciousness, basically, right? So what is the idea is that, is that when you interpret a stimulus, there is a process that goes on and it goes on and, and that the process, so you don't, you don't, you really don't live in the present. You can you live in some, some, uh, some past time and, and, and then your, your brain is uh, assembling things together. So this is to say that, you know, despite the possibility of of somewhat producing some sensation by electrical stimuli and timing and all the things that I was saying before, the, 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 the possibility to convey sensory info information and perception to the brain through electrical stimuli is still pretty much um, to be discovered. Okay, so let me switch, if I have time, to the second part. So we talk about brain machine. Now I talk about body machine. And, and here comes to mind this situation, okay? The brain-machine interface is a brain, is the metaphor, is a brain and a jar. Your body does serve, is not, you know, is the matrix, right? So you don't uh, need a body, you need a body. You just have all these fantastic displays and so on. You stimulate, you put your brain into a jar, and you can have all the reality that you want, right? They've made movies about that. Yeah, they make movies, <laughs> and, you know, now there you, can, you can do all sorts of uh, fiction and so on. Um, now this is guy is an interesting guy, is uh, Sang Mok Lee. So he is a he is a is a geophysicist that uh, in oceanography. That's where he graduated at. Uh, he's from Korea. He graduated at MIT. 
and we uh, got the faculty position in Seoul, and then uh, and then he went to a trip uh, in uh, in California. They were to survey in the desert uh, in, uh, in one of the desert California, and he was on a on one of those uh, uh, vehicles that go in the de in the vehicle basically rolled over, and he found himself uh, for the bridge. And now he is a spokesperson for people that are paralyzed. He's actually very active on that. And he came once to MIT. And he has, he has a, a wheelchair and, uh, and he has a set of switches. And one thing he was complaining is that saying, well, but I, I, I still can move some of my body. So it's like, you know, you, you have lost a lot of it, but you can still move your shoulder, right? And he felt that basically the technology that he was given uh, was was okay, but it was kind of essentially not uh, ignoring the fact that uh, that he has a body still. You know, your your body is paralyzed, but it's still there in some very significant proportion. Okay, so I don't know. Maybe we are also in a, in a, in a cultural framework that the body is not important or something like that. And maybe come from from other kind of biases, but 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 in fact the body is important. And uh, and so uh, when it comes to deciding if you have a paralysis, uh, would you like to have a brain machine interface that capture your brain intention this way and, uh, and then you live this virtual life? Or would you like rather, if you can, to learn to rearrange whatever mo motion mobility and capability you have somewhat to recover as much as possible of your ability to control your environment? Do you need really a lot of it, right? So, in many cases, what I'm saying is that if you think about in many, many of the tasks that we do can actually, many of the tasks that are done with brain machine interfaces are pretty low dimensional tasks. I was showing a cursor moving on a screen. So, if you can, can control a computer screen, you control basically everything because you're going to control every machine attached to it. So, the, the dimensionality that you really need to do functional things is relatively low, okay? And so the dimensionality that remains in your body after injury can be still uh, significantly higher, okay? And so you can still do a lot of things. And, and maybe that's, a, that's another, an alternative way to go. So this is the, if you want, is the, is the, is the background. Now, there is a work <coughs> a long time ago by uh, Jeff Hinton and a colleague, Sigmund Fels, that was not related to this, but I think is is interesting, nevertheless. I am Sam. I am Sam. Sam, so. I am. That Sam, I am. That Sam, I am. I do not like that Sam, I am. You know that, you know the story, right? There you go. The <laughs> green eggs and M and, uh, and all the story. But, so what's going on here? What's here, what's happening is that this is actually a work that came a little earlier than the Cyberglobe was 90-something. But they had a cyber, a sort of a cyber glove, and so basically what they have is an instrumental glove and some switches, okay? And this is a grad student that was earning his doctoral uh, thesis, I think, or something, by spending, you know, he did other things also, but spend, spending about a couple of months uh, dealing with a, a, a neural network. Uh, Jeff Hinton is one of the, 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 the masters of neural networks. Uh, he's one of the people that went uh, both mach machine and neural back propagation and all these things. But basically the idea is that here you have an analog model, not a, di not a discrete, but an analog model of local trunk. And then you have a neural net, and, and here you have a subject with a certain <coughs> devices connected to hand gestures and motions. And the idea is that then you have a, 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 a learning relationship, and the subject is learning to, to move the hand and, uh, and the, the, to, uh, to somewhat to, to, to produce phonemes. And it's an interesting process because the process, you know, this, the subject would give example of how we do certain sounds and then, and then the, the network will, will implement them and then the network will also generalize across those examples and so the subject is to learn what, what the network has learned. So it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a dual uh, iterative curling, but the, the point is that after some time, uh, this guy was actually controlling the the, the vocal track as a as a 
as a conductor of an orchestra, substantially, right? And was able to do, um, yeah. was able also to do conversation. One thing that is interesting here, there is a, there is a topic that I will not go too much into it, but I think is important, is that is the topic of, of, of continuous versus discrete control. So you think about speech, there is a way of doing speech which is by, by, by say, American Sign Language, right? So you can consider speech as, 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 a, as, a, as, a, as a set, as a, as a discrete business, where you have a set of gestures, and the issue is to recognize the gestures, and then you, you produce those very, you know, discrete and separate uh, elements of sounds, right? Then the other approach is that instead you have a continuous machine, and so, and that is what biology is normal. Okay, your 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 vocal tract is not a discrete, a classified. So you can produce a, a continuum and so on. So in fact, through this kind of uh, apparatus, this guy was able to convey also prosody and things in ways that you normally do not do with the easily with the, with the, with discrete method. So there are there there is a lot of. Uh, uh, Things, there are things to understand at that, uh, at that at the juncture between uh, continuous and discrete. So uh, I, I don't think I have much time. Uh, let, let me let me go a little fast here because what we used that uh, was as a starting point to somewhat study the, the remapping of space. So instead of we wanted to have a situation where instead of implanting a monkeys with uh, with a brain uh, with uh, uh, with electrodes, why not just do something that is similar, that is you take, you take the output, take a, a cyber glove, and so this thing is generating 20 signals, and, and you somewhat have a subject learning to control a cursor on a monitor, right, by, by making continuous gestures. So this is work that uh, we did some, some time ago, and, and, and we studied the, the process of learning to which people learn to what we call remapping the, the, the gestures and the movement of the fingers to match the, the external space. And what we, what we saw is that there are two, two aspects of this. Is one is that subject uh, across sections, they learn to, to make more precise reaches, okay? They basically, they learn the task. That's not interesting. I mean, you ask somebody to learn something, they learn. What is interesting in a learning experiment is what people do that you don't ask them to do. So we don't tell them how to reach those targets. They can do any kind of trajectory. In fact, it, they make zigzag and so on. What is interesting and somewhat in parallel, without us telling them, we measure something that is called a linearity uh, factor or aspect ratio, that is the amount of lateral deviation of a movement versus the extent of a movement. Basically, it means that if you make a straight line, this, this, this quantity, uh, so that the, the ratio between a, b, and a, c, that is zero. Okay, if you make it straight, it goes to zero. And if, if not, it's different from zero. So basically, this is a is a measurement of the fact that people <laughs> will tend to make movement that are straighter, even if we don't tell them to make straighter movement. There are other things that we can study in this case, and that's, that's what is called the, 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 the issue of, uh, of, of kinematic redundancy. So uh, the, the nice thing of those kind of studies is that they allow you to to somewhat study the underlying geometry <coughs> and the way mo movement are constructed. So here the idea is this. You know, if you have a, a cyber glove, is, you have 20 signals. I cannot draw a 20-dimensional space, and so I take a proxy like a three-dimensional space. So you have a points in the, in the glove signals that are in this high-dimensional space, but you have that, for instance, a point B would map in a point P here, uh, but if I have to go, go to a point Q on the screen, I have many possible choices that all will map on the point Q because I go from a, from a low dimension to a high dimension. And so one thing is you, you can start seeing how, how subject, what subject, would the subject learn? And effectively what the subjects seem to learn through practice, they seem to learn to uh, minimize the amount of motion that does not result in the motion of the cursor. Let me try to explain a little. Unfortunately, this is not a projector. If it were a projector, you know, you, you can you imagine that you want to control the, the, the shadow of your finger, right, on, on a projection, right? You can, you, can, you can move in many different ways, right? You can move this way, I can move this way, so I, I can make many motions to make, give me to the same point, right? If I know 
how this projection is organized, I may end up moving consistently with that. That is parallel to the screen. Okay? So, not, so in other words, I minimize the movement outside of the screen that are the movements that are not that are useless somewhat, right? And so what happens essentially is that subject seems to be uh, learning the the structure, the, the, the geometry of the map that is imposed on them by this cyber globe, which is very, uh, you know, it's very abstract for them. It's not, it's not like this one. This one, you, you know, you see something, you see the projected geometry is clear. In the case of the, of the globe, is, is, a, is essentially is a particular combination of finger motions that you don't know. So but somewhat there are, there's a process of discovery that seems to somewhat, as a result, the, the subject essentially discovers the geometrical structure of the space that is controlling, right? And, 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 and to do so, probably in the end, it produces more effective movement. So we, um, let me, oh, that's, that's fine. There's another, oh, another possible application that of all this in, in a non-clinical field is the idea that uh, of uh, tonal spaces, you know, for, for you that are musicians, you can actually, like this work of Euler, where was representing chords, minor and, 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 and major chords, and, uh, and uh, you may want to uh, make a geometrical representation of those chords, and, and then you have a remapping, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's another kind of instrument, music instrument, but somewhat the point is that you may want to connect this to studies of how, for instance, sounds as geometrical properties and how those geometrical properties may relate to geometrical properties of the body. But let me go to the, the wheelchair part. So this is an early prototype uh, based on, uh, on uh, infrared uh, markers. And now we are going to accelerometric uh, <coughs> accelerometers because they make more sense. There are lots of systems like this. What, what is important here is that to move the control of the wheelchair, the subject is making very minimum movement of the shoulders. And, uh, and so uh, the, the issue here is, uh, can you think of, uh, of using, of, of creating an interface to learn this kind of things, to learn to reorganize those movements? So, this is what I call the BMI paradigm, where, where it's a learning paradigm where BMI can stand both for body machine and brain machine. If you're not too much uh, Cartesian, you can think it's the same thing. <coughs> on one hand, you have a body which has a set of uh, uh, signals, um, and, so, and, and so you have a set of residual control signals. On the other hand, you have instruments that could be you know, robots, wheelchairs, computers, pianos, it does, doesn't matter. And, but you have a, a process, what you need is a, is a, is a, is a translation mechanism. And, and there is also a, a, a learning or a dual learning process where the machine has to learn to respond appropriately to body motions, and also the patient or the user has to uh, practice uh, uh, and learn new commands. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting <coughs> area of study where maybe one of the things that is important to understand is, is the timing of, of those transformations. So, you know, you want to have a machine learning, but not too fast, because if the machine changes too rapidly, then it becomes confusing to the user. Uh, and if it does it too slowly, it becomes inefficient. So there is an issue of finding the, the best uh, possible way. So what, uh, what we have done in a set of uh, preliminary uh, studies is to uh, have a set of uh, sensor signals somewhat scattered on different upper body parts. And uh, what we want to do is to embed, what technically to, is called an embedding of the, 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 the space the, where the control signal, which is a two-dimensional space, into the, the signal space. And we want to find somewhat the optimal embedding. What does it mean? What it means that if you uh, were to make Move random movement with your shoulder, with your upper body, okay? And you have a set of accelerometers or a set of cameras. What happens is that you're going to have, say, eight, nine signals that uh, are produced by this movement. And if you look at how the movement varies, okay, you will find out that people will tend to be optimal in producing signals 
on, on certain direction, on certain dimension of this i-dimensional space. And so the first thing to look for, if you want, is to see how people would tend to naturally distribute the land. So this is a protocol that we have developed uh, in which uh, we, we first do uh, what we call a dance, where we ask a subject to do free upper body movement. Sometimes we also have music in the background. And so they, 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 they essentially move, uh, move their, their upper body as best uh, or as they prefer. Then we do a principal component analysis, which is essentially very simple standard statistics to find out how variance is distributed in this high dimensional space. And then we find the two dimensions which have the highest amount of variance and do some small what we call frame adjustment that is rotation of the axis and so on so that in the end the monitor that they have in front corresponds to the space of, that is produced during this dance. And so that, after that what we do is a set of, uh, of, uh, of exercises. So here is actually, these are movies from a couple of, uh, of our uh, spinal cord injury subjects. These are subjects that have been relatively high injury to the spinal cord and, uh, and uh, so they, they cannot really control a joystick or with a hand because they lo lost a lot of mobility. And, uh, and so here, you hear the music is because of the dance I was talking behind. But, uh, but so this is, is the, the, the video is pretty bad, but it is what he's doing, the cursor is, uh, is, uh, is uh, reaching, um, is used to reach a movement. The, the, the voice in the background is Maura Kazakia who has been doing those experiments uh, extensively. And um, so basically the subject here is, is making reaching movement that normally you would do with an arm, but he's doing them with a, with a shoulder. And uh, here, you have other possibilities is actually to to use this to to play play video games commercially. Once you once you have a, the equivalent of a, once you have the equivalent of a, of, a, of a joystick control, you can play Tetris. This is not yeah, boring, but you can have a, 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 what, what, any 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 available games you can 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 be used. And these are very important uh, training elements because these are people that may have to stay long time in bed. And, and there is a degree of empowerment that is associated with the fact that they can do this, and once they can do this, they can also use their keyboard to write email, navigate, and and possibly as one other application that we look at is the is the, is the locomotion with the control of a wheelchair, because initially the idea was to to find a, uh, to find a virtual wheelchair. It would be great to have this kind of technologies that you have here to 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 somewhat map the the, the visual space to provide a, a stronger uh, you know, visual. This is mostly a proof of concept. And what is interesting, so, so these are simple techniques. What, what we see here is that we, we see two type of subjects making rich in body rich in movement. This is an unimpaired control subject at the beginning of the session, at the end of the session. And this is a highly paralyzed subject. You see the movements are much more confused. And at the end of the sub uh, session, his performances become similar to the one of the control subject at the beginning. So there is a learning uh, that happens. What I think is more, the, the interesting things could happen collateral to that, which is essentially a process of, through which uh, coordination is reorganized. So what, what happens here, well, this is a, maybe a subtle point, but essentially what happens is that in the beginning, uh, in, in the first uh, target set, these are three subjects. You, you have a, a very high variance in the first principal component, much lower here, the second, and so on. After they practice, what you see progressively is that the second principal component becomes progressively more important, a little bit at the expense of the first. So in other words, what it means is that the subject is becoming more planar. It's becoming, starts moving more uh, in, in a plane because it's exposed to a plane. It's a little bit similar to the story I was saying before of learning the, the, the geometrical structure that they're controlling. And this is also even more strongly confirmed by the fact that not only the subject learn to move in a plane, but they learn to match the plane in which they move to the plane that is effectively uh, generated by the initial dance. So all of this is, uh, is, 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 a, is one form of, of uh, mapping that is suggesting that that can be used 
for uh, for somewhat recreating a, a new kind of intuitive space. And another thing that I want to finish off very briefly, I mentioned before the Kalman decoding that is done with, with brain signals. One student that in the lab now is, is actually working to use the same approach but with the body signal. There's no reason, you can, instead of using the brain signal, you can use the same things and use a Kalman decoder and see which one is better, if it is better to use a simple principal component analysis base or, or use a dynamical based system. The Kalman decoder seems to work. Okay, so <coughs> the conclusions you see, this, so, saw it already, but if you now look at the brain machine and body machine uh, <coughs> debate, if you want, the, the brain machine is, is, a, is, the brain machine interface ha has certain distinctive properties and, and, and values. One of them is that it is a new tool for, no, it's, not only a, a, it's not only a practical tool for people with paralysis, but it's a way to investigate the brain. Because in a way, you can ask questions about how the brain processes information by virtue of the fact that you are looking to a very reduced amount of tissue, and you can actually close the loop and stimulate them. So there are lots of things that you can study about brain plasticity and learning through brain-machine interfaces. And plasticity is one of the most important things to understand how it relates to learning. The fact is that the brain-machine interface has limited applications because, you know, you, 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 important applications, but basically, in certain cases, there are no other ways. There are, there are certain levels, I mean, there are horrible level of paralysis, like uh, the locked-in syndrome, where it comes after you have people have a stroke of the pontine area, where, uh, you know, there is no movement left, not even blinking, okay? And uh, I remember once that it was, how, how you ask informed consent in these cases? And once once told me how you ask informed consent in these cases, and I thought it was kind of creepy, interesting, but, uh, you know, they were asking the person, if you want to participate to this study, think of milk. If you want to not participate, think of lemon. And if you think of milk or lemon, the pH of your saliva, saliva changes. And so they measure the pH of the saliva as an instrument of, of the coding <laughs> tension. So, so that's a, it's a German group that does that for, for actually not for invasive, for non-invasive interface, for the EG ones. But um, so, yeah, you, have to, you have to find a way to, to get through. So in these cases, I don't think you can use body movement because uh, there are no body movement left, basically. But people with paralysis, uh, you know, the, the, go to the body machines, there is a much broader clinical impact because there is, a, there is a broad spectrum of disability where you want to really learn to optimize whatever remains. And so you can create also devices. There is the, fa the fact that you use the body it's not only that it, it's not only a practical <laughs> advantage that you learn to compute, control a computer or wheelchair, but also that in doing so you move your body, and in moving your body you do exercise and you do things that are critical for your well-being in case of uh, spinal cord injury. Because you know one of the major dangers people are severe spinal cord injury is that they don't move, and so the fact that you keep some mobility up. Uh, is it has very important consequences, cardiovascular consequences, and so on, that are collateral, but are uh, non, uh, not, uh, not, not second. Like last, but not least, at the level of understanding the motor learning and how the brain control movement, you can also use these body machines in the same way. And, and they share algorithms. So in a way, working with the body becomes also a means to test in a non-invasive manner uh, algorithm and things that can then be used in, uh, in a very machine interface. So that's more or less where things stand at this time. Thanks. Any questions? I'm just curious about um, your the, the research that your own lab does. Yeah. You know, some <laughs> so we, we do, uh, we have recently, we got, uh, uh, we expect to have funded a study on spinal cord injury for this developing this uh, body machine interface and, uh, and uh, to do a somewhat more extensive. This, all what I showed so far was somewhat preliminary work, so relatively few 
people involved, there should be more of the clinical trial. So it's people who still have some mobility? People that still have some, but, but reduced. So something like C3, C4 uh, level of lesion, which means that they, they don't... Uh, we will see, because actually we may want to go to also some higher mobility, but to say right now people that, that have sufficient... Uh, that people normally would use switches. They, people that have uh, this kind of lesions, they, they use instruments like head switches or um, uh, sip and puff devices. And they have to learn them and they're kind of cumbersome. So we would like to actually to, have, to reverse a little bit the paradigm and have the interface learning them rather than the other way around. So to have more of the learning shared by the, the device and less by the, the cards. So essentially, and we want it, this thing to be adapted because in time mobility changes it, uh, to some extent. So these are um, things. There, there are several directions that we are into. One, one other thing that we do, one thing that we cannot do right now, when you do a clinical study, you initially you want to have a population of, of, of subjects that are stable. So you want to have people, for instance, primary injury uh, some years after the meeting so that you know that whatever happens is not because of the initial recovery processes. But really, I think what I think would be useful to do for, for, for it would be to try to use these technologies for people in the moment they are they, 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 they get to the hospital. It would be less of a, if you want, it's less of a, it's more difficult to make it as a science study, but that is the point where, where somebody has the highest level of depression and uh, uh, shock about the, the thing. So the fact that they can, I think the fact that they, to give them the, 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 the feeling that they can still interact, uh, you know, write letters, do things, that their, their life is not, is not, is not over, uh, I think it's, it's important also in this early part. And so at some point I think we would like also to use it in the more, more acute stages uh, of, the, of the disability. Then there are also other things that be not necessarily spinal cord, could be stroke, could be Said of policy, the number. And so, I guess, since I'm not an expert here, yeah. um, I have this uh, media vision of, you know, Steve Hawking, who I don't know the extent to which you know, <coughs> what his injury means, but, you know, yes. he's able to communicate completely. So you kind of have this idea that, you know, people might have a possibility of communicating right. to the world. Yeah. And, and so how, how how true is this statement? How many people? Is it, do people normally have access to this, or it depends on their insurance, or? Did you see the title in the bottom part? Uh, I saw the movie, I finished it, that was a punch. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a true story. But the fact, in fact, that, uh, the fact that they, are, they were using this, uh, there is this thing that they, even, even, right, that even, even if you can put out, say, one character per minute, you know, you have so much time and so much you need to do it that the guy at the end wrote the book or something like that. It's, uh -huh. it's kind of very cumbersome it was, process. It's, it's a very well done movie. Yeah. I mean, they put you in his position and that really made me very That, that was life. one of the strokes. That was one of Rockin syndrome that I was saying. The Stephen Hawking's case is the amyotrophic uh, lateral sclerosis. I mean, is a, usually is a, a something which has a much more uh, dramatic course is that uh, Lugaric disease also. People are usually have a very rapid uh, decline. In this case, because it was very young, I think it's, uh, it's been a, it's a, it's a very rare case where the, the, the situation has stabilized right? a lot, which is, is not common for the type of disease. disease. But ALS, in fact, ALS is one of the areas where the groups of uh, the brain gate group, the donor group, is, is actually thinking to uh, intervene most because of the nature of the progressive nature of the disease. Um, you know, the, the idea is that, um, it's, 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 it's strange to say that. So if, you're, if your brain is still working, if, you're, if your cognitive abilities are intact, then there are means to, 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 to get, to get, in, to get uh, stuff out, to get information out or, or back in. Mm -hmm. So I think it is possible to not uh, um, the, the, the big challenge that you have, there are two challenges. One is the, 
the throughput of information, the information rate that you can generate in terms of bit per second. And the other is the learning, because you have to learn to somewhat, in the case of brain machine interface, you have to learn to address those hundred neurons that are connected, and, uh, and, and that's, a, that's a big uh, learning challenge if you want this. But, uh, but it's possible, yeah, I think it's a, uh, th there's nothing in this field that comes for free. I mean, even the cochlear implants, is the first brain machine interface, people with cochlear implants, it's not that they immediately hear and understand sounds. I think they, for a period of time, they hear noise, and then they learn to interpret, and their brain actually learns to interpret the noise, and in the end they recover audition, but it's a learning mechanism. And the same thing for this, so there is a lot of, uh, there is a big learning process that needs to take place with the, BA, with the brain machine and body machine interface, in which the kind of technologies that you have here are, it's extremely important, it's potentially very difficult, because it, 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 it's a matter of engagement, it's also a matter of uh, what, what visual and what sensory stimuli you produce. So I think it, it, it's not, uh, it's not, it's not a, a surgical business. It's something that uh, happens after the surgery. So the, the support that you can produce is, is tremendously important. And it's tremendously important both what you can do with the big systems like this in the hospital, but maybe even more important what you can do at home. You know, when people are you know, discharged from the hospital and then they, 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 they are not going to have a cave for themselves, but maybe, you know, the, the, the advantage that those technologies become more accessible, and so it's... Uh, yeah, no, um, it's about, so you said that in the beginning the, um, these devices, you put them in the brains and they capture the, um, the thoughts in, 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 um, in electric waves or something? In brain activity. Brain activity. Now, how does that device distinguish, or is there a distinction, you know, I'm just talking about the, the neurological level, between thoughts and emotions? So, do they, is there any interference? Is it the same? Is it something? How does it get decoded, or does it create any problem? Yeah. Well, all, right now, that's the way. We don't neither talk thoughts nor emotions are the. You, you cannot read the brain. Okay? You don't read thoughts and you don't read emotions. What you can read, to some extent, is intention, right? Which is something that is a very focused intention. So, all what you can do is you read the intention of moving a point in a certain direction, right? And that's not uh, really a thought. This is a, is a, is a, sub -class, is a subclass of the thoughts is the intention. So all, all, the, all what we can do now, because there is a lot of um, bad propaganda in the media, so you, know, you control things by thought. You, you, the, the idea is that you are you, you control by thought to the extent that intention is a kind of thought. But that's as far that's as you go. You can. you can train somewhat the person to connect the intention, a specific intention, with the with the signal coming out of them. And so possibly, you know, you can you can you know can in the future, maybe a couple of centuries ahead, people will be able to also uh, generalize across more complex thoughts. So, so then you probably need to really look at more uh, many more uh, neurons, many more so the oxymoron of the brain machine interface that we look at, we have, we have like uh, 100 billion neurons, and we are looking at 100. So, you know, right so, so Sandro, one of the things that the class has really dealt with and struggled with has been how do you get augmented devices on people? And yet, people who uh, are in wheelchairs have a platform, much like a car. They have a platform for augmented devices. They have a power source. They have. They, they don't have to necessarily worry about a lot of weight. There, there are more. There are heavier things that can be put on them. There are networks that would be easier to implement. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I'm not talking about people who are locked in or people who are quadriplegic, but someone who is. Uh, but the politics are the chest, not the Yeah. So yeah. they do, they do. But I'm talking about some with more mobility, up around mo mobility, so that they could 
you, know, you could power your, your wheelchair, but you could also have other things that could augment what your abilities are and perhaps give you abilities beyond what a person who doesn't have augmentics have but is not in a wheelchair, for example. Because you have a platform in which you can put a lot of stuff on. You, you can, to, so if I understand, yeah, you, that, um, you, you, you don't, that's, that's an interesting subject because is the issue of, is the issue only the issue of uh, recovering skills that are uh, available or is the issue possibly the issue of uh, um, somewhat doing something more than normal people do. Okay, so you, you know, in a way, I, I like to think that you know you can go beyond the uh, recovery. For instance, uh, in a sense, one 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 simple thing that people looking a little bit ahead were were considering is, for instance, the possibility to communicate uh, by either by brain activities or maybe by by body motion, but somewhat communicate directly to another point. Could be a physician, or could be a so you, you, you have a you have a you can actually exploit those things to increase the amount of connectivity of a person, right? Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so this is a uh, right, right now. I mean, that we are so behind that we have to somewhat try to restore some of the very basics. But as I say, if you can restore the ability to control a computer monitor, you can do basically all all what you normally uh, you can. Yes. Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask. So you discussed uh, the issues involved with brain machine interfaces. You know, there's obviously the open surface and dimension issue. There's the fact that you're only monitoring a handful of neurons out of the massive orchestra that's the brain. Um, what about the possibility of tapping into the central nervous system at a different point? Like in somebody that's quadriplegic, uh, tapping into the section of the spinal cord that's still intact. And you know that you've got fewer uh, signals to read. You've got a smaller space to work with. Um, that has, you know, I'm not sure exactly where, what the state of the art is. Yeah, no, no, no. But that, that's true. So in fact, there is a research, for instance, to um, to to stimulate the dorsal root ganglia to produce uh, to to convey a sensation, right? Um, so <coughs> it's an area. There are so many things going on. There is also Possibly there is all the, the field of regeneration where we want to actually, you know, build the scaffolds and possibly having having the nerve pathways re, re, being regenerated across a, across the lesions that would actually restore the function potential. I mean, with nothing like that has happened yet, but that's uh, that's one of the things. But yes, the the, the spinal cord, uh, the problem with the spinal cord, the spinal cord is not is not very easy to access. Uh, it's somewhat paradoxical. I think it's easier to intervene on the on the on the brain than intervening on the spinal cord, uh, uh, sort of mechanically, right? In the sense of uh, uh, the, the structure itself, the spinal cord itself is uh, uh, it's, it's, it's complex. Uh, it's, it's less, I think, it's less understood than, than certain processing happening in, in, a, in, a, in in the central area, so in the cortex. In the cortex, you have this thing that motor, you have three motor sensory, so there is some, some, some classification, which is very, you know, it's questionable to some extent, but it's, it's, more, uh, it's more clear than the, the classification that you have in the spinal cord. In the spinal cord, you have, uh, have dorsal roots, ventral roots, you have uh, motor neurons, and you have this structure of interneurons that connect different segments, but you know what? What exactly? What some? What, what is doing? What is is not that clear, and accessing it surgically is also complicated because this part of the body moves more. So making a spinal implant, I don't know if it's feasible. feasible whereas brain implants are, are now common. So there are these kind of things. But yes, there are people working on other parts. Does the same job essentially? It's predicted, mm -hmm. and and other people, I, 
there are people that use Wiener filter in a similar way. I was describing this Kalman filter. So, 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 yeah, I think that, that yeah. I was just wondering. Yeah, so, so Wiener filters are, are also used uh, for that purpose of uh, doing state definition. So you'd say that some fundamentals of these interfaces could be traced back to a history of like first school of cybernetic thought. Pretty much, I think so. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I think so. You know, it, it's funny, you know, that's, uh, yeah. You know what is interesting about the, the computer in general is that, how many of you have read, read the von Neumann book with the computer and the brain? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, uh, one thing I remember when I was a student, like, they're always talking about the von Neumann architecture or something like, you know, ah, nothing, nothing like the nervous system because it's the processing and the memory. And the guy actually was trying to make an artificial brain. So he's, <laughs> so he's actually being, you know, bad mouthed by saying it was not it was interested in this time. In fact, people were thinking to build a computers as artificial brain, not as means to to watch movies on them. <laughs> <laughs> Controlling a wheelchair with eye movement would be dangerous. Always time to something interesting. <laughs> 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 yeah, this this kind of uh, but no, that, that's one other thing. The, the, the other areas there, there is a, there is a vision prosthetics, right? There's a, there are groups that are that are actually stimulating uh, visual areas in the brain. They they all, so far they only have been able to produce prosthetics that produce this kind of stuff that they really don't. Uh, but what, what way you were thinking about the cameras? As, a, as, a, as an input device? Or? Just using that as the sensor, uh, as uh -huh. opposed to other kinds of sensing techniques, as opposed to accelerometers or whatever sort of Oh, as a sensor for, um, so because usually, OK, the idea is to use, a, use something to estimate, uh, to the state estimation. Uh, OK, there are possibilities, for instance, to use, uh, um, say, the, the data glass something like that, like, you know, you have your glasses and, and, and you can, can possibly think of using uh, image processing analysis to extract movements of the, of the hand or the, the, the part of the body or the, uh, to, to, to use them as images. I, I don't think that it is too much around in that area, but uh, I think that uh, I don't see why not. Yeah, I just brought up the term non-invasive is something that's very desirable. It's like you uh, sensors do not sort of take data directly from the body, but simply observations of what the body is doing as the sort of input for controlling that. Right. So, so, you're right. So, for instance, in our case, in the, in the wheelchair, what we were doing, we were doing uh, actually uh, infrared cameras with, uh, with optical and sensor cameras. One of the reasons why I abandoned them is that uh, they're, they're changing luminance. These are not well, there are two things. One is that you have to carry out the ear to these cameras. Uh, you look, you are usually sticking out. So it, they, they increase the volume of uh, the thing moving, which is may, may not be practical. But, uh, and the other thing is that there are changes in the lighting condition uh, that uh, may also be. But, uh, you know, it, it certainly it, it may be actually better for instance, in the case of, if, if instead of thinking of, of uh, an interface for uh, driving a wheelchair, you think something for controlling a computer, you may get at home, something like a Kinect or something like that may be 
be better. Right? So it's been, so it's been it, is a, it, it, there is a kind of a evolutionary competition between these different things. Let's see where it goes. I'm not going to let you leave without putting you on the spot. I, I am on the spot. <laughs> so predict what you see will happen in 10 years. I gave you an easy one. I was going to say more, but 10 years. What's, what's, going, to, what's going to happen? BMI, BMI. You may not be around. <laughs> no, the, 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 let me tell you something. Because when I, I came in the United States in 1982, with a very strong prediction that I would stay 20. <laughs> yeah. So whatever I can tell you now, you can use it to know what's not going to happen in 10 years from now. Um, predict what happens in 10 years. I am better this time. I'm really, um, I, 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 I can see the present. Um, I, I wish um, that, uh, I mean, I, I wish that some of the goals that I have will 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 be fulfilled, and some of them will be essentially that uh, we are able to create a learning system that we learn another learning system that is a human to control something, and and, uh, and so I I would like to see that happening in various domains, uh, maybe less than ten years, I don't know, maybe now. But um, yeah, you put me on the spot. I did. What now? What would you predict in the next minute? What would I predict? Yeah, I'm not on the spot. Yeah, you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, for instance, in in uh, the use of stem cells to regrow various parts of the brain or parts of the spinal cord. Suppose you were to grow parts of the spinal cord back. Would you still be able to control your leg? Would those neurons go to the same muscles? Would the sensory system be all messed up? Would the motor system be all messed up? Would you have to retrain someone to, to well, learn? And could they learn? Yeah, so I, I, I think that, that, that uh, to me it's almost obvious that if there is any form of regeneration or regrowth, you will have to deal with a, re, with a relearning, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm a little bit, uh, sometimes a little bit pessimistic about uh, how this thing tends to evolve, right? Mm -hmm. Because we have this uh, explosion of uh, hopeful views and uh, that we, scientists usually push their, you know, there's another bioethics issue, you know, that we, we tend, to, tend to make promises that are far, uh, far away from what is realistic because we need money. Mm -hmm. uh, we lie for the money. <laughs> It's funny, but that's uh, yeah. theorized. Yeah, theorized. Yeah. But uh, yeah. So what do you um, so uh, no, I, I was asked this kind of question, for so instance. So I think you know what what I really would like to have is to have a, uh, environments that are more more friendly and more accessible to to, to the users and, and I what the other thing I would like to see seriously in the next ten years what I really would like to see is that this this fancy technology is going down in cost at the point where people can afford them uh, and without being in a high tech center or something like that. So it's a um, That's another trend that is important. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, and so going, uh, so the business going down, going low cost without sacrificing too much of the quality, right? So right now, for instance, accelerometers, the one that you have in your cell phone, yeah, well, maybe less than a dollar or something like that. But then, if you want to find a precise accelerometer, you have to still spend uh, thousands. Um, so these are uh, concrete changes. Sandra, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So next week. Uh, next week. Next week. Next week. Uh, 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 I'll be talking. I will talk briefly. Todd. Oh, and Todd. Yes.
uh, uh, Press Kuykin from uh, RIC is coming over and will talk to us about prosthetics. And uh, I will talk a little finalize the talk about brain uh, body area networks. Hopefully. Okay. So, uh, any questions?